All right. Okay. Let's start. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Hola, hello, bonjour, hola. Ni hao, konnichiwa. Annyeonghaseyo and hello all. And welcome and thank you, Simbis people, for joining us the 87th seminar. And I call it a Harvard Medical School Day. This week is a very rare week when I am at home without traveling. However, we have an important conference where I will am attending virtually. It is the second Africa Synthetic Biology Conference, and I am an invited speaker again to start the conference this year, as I did for the first Africa Synthetic Biology Conference last year. I'm really glad to see that Symbio is becoming really global, including Africa. Okay, it is my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Professor Vamzi Musa. He does not need any introduction. He is an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and a professor of systems biology and medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is also a member of National Academy of Science and Medicine. I really thank almost 20 National Academy members who joined and support the seminar series so far, and including him today. Famzi, thank you so much for your scientific contribution to the community and nurturing young speakers, including today's rising star, Tier Tall. And actually, he happened to be my classmate. And the virtual podium is all yours now. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Taesuk. It's a real pleasure to participate in this uh, seminar series. This is such an exciting uh, discipline. The fact that you're able to galvanize so many uh, young investigators, senior investigators, others uh, from throughout the world. I just know that you and your seminar series are going to have an important impact. Uh, and it's a delight for me and TL to be tag teaming today uh, in this 87th uh, installment. So I'm going to dive in. My goal for the first five to 10 minutes is to try to provide a brief introduction to our research team. And TL is a really, really important integral member of that team. But I'll provide a little bit of a broader overview of, of, of our group. And then I'm going to hand it over to you at that point. So hopefully uh, this looks OK. So just a brief introduction to the Muta Laboratory. We started. Um, almost 20 years ago or so as one of the first labs to be affiliated with Harvard Medical School's uh, newly formed Department of Systems Biology. And in 2004, uh, as the first new recruit to the department, I set up the laboratory both at Mass General Hospital as well as at the Broad Institute. So those are our three affiliations. And ever since the beginning, we have really been entirely focused on bioenergetics and specifically mitochondrial biology. And over the years, we've been very, very fortunate to be funded by a number of different agencies, uh, especially the National Institutes of Health, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and a variety of philanthropies to whom we're very grateful. I think what's very different about our research team, which is shown here posing for our 15th uh, lab anniversary uh, during the pandemic, I think what makes our lab very unique and different is in addition to having traditional postdoctoral fellows uh, clinical scientist fellows, uh, PhD students, MD students, and undergraduate students, we also invest heavily in professional research staff, professional research scientists, the types that worked at IBM Watson Research and at Bell Labs, whose sole focus is to make new discoveries. And so I think this mix of trainees and research staff uh, creates a really, really interesting mix. Um, the members in our group are doing great science, I think. Uh, some of them continue to stay on in our group as research scientists. And then the alumni have gone on to a variety of institutions where they're leading their own independent research groups. Uh, and we're also very proud of the fact that we have alumni that are biotech founders, uh, as well as leaders in R&D in biotech and in pharma. And I wanna just state at the outset, we are always recruiting for 
really, really talented uh, folks. Um, I'm going to provide a brief overview of what we work on. The entire laboratory is focused on mitochondria, and there's a number of different reasons why we're so fascinated by this organelle. As many of you in the audience uh, know, mitochondria are very, very closely related to bacteria because one and a half billion years ago, they were bacteria and then formed a union probably with something like a modern day archaea to produce a complex uh, cell. And they still retain a vestige of this bacterial ancestry. They have their own tiny, tiny genome, the mitochondrial DNA that's maternally transmitted. But it's called the powerhouse of the cell because of the machinery that's shown in the middle of this figure, the oxidative phosphorylation system. This is where nearly all of the oxygen that we breathe gets uh, leveraged to make ATP uh, to power thought and movement and uh, memories. And so all of these different aspects uh, at a very basic science level really fascinate us and motivate our work. We're also very interested in human disease. As it turns out, there's a number of different conditions ranging from the aging process itself all the way to very rare devastating monogenic diseases that impact mitochondrial function. And aging, of course, is a very complex phenomenon, but during aging, the number of our mitochondria and their activity normalized per mitochondrion declines. And so that probably contributes in some way to the fatigue and lack of energy we all face as we get older. Um, but understanding something like mitochondrion aging is very complicated because it's gonna involve the mix of many genes, the environment and chance. Uh, and so in order to better understand some of these more common processes, our lab is historically focused on ultra rare single gene disorders uh, with the idea that there's no medicines currently approved for those disorders, so we want to do something for them, but we may also learn something by studying the rare that has implications for the common. And so those are sort of the two broad thrusts of our lab, and here are some of the major questions of the Mutha lab today, and I'll just show one slide for each of these uh, four main uh, themes. Number one is we want to systematically the way that a systems biologist would define the full functional circuitry of the mitochondrion. We want to know what the molecular basis of mitochondrial diseases are. A couple of years ago, we made this really, really interesting observation that whether you're a yeast or a C. elegans or even a mouse, if you have a broken mitochondrial respiratory chain, simply by placing that organism in low oxygen continuously, we can have a dramatic improvement on the well-being of that organism. And so we're trying to understand that better. And finally, uh, we're trying to develop new tools the way that synthetic biologists would to try to investigate mitochondrial biology. So just one slide on each of these, or just a few slides. Um, again, this, or this organelle has its own DNA that was actually sequenced by Fred Sanger in 1981. And he reported that it only encodes 13 proteins total. So by necessity, all of the other proteins in this organelle must come from the nuclear genome. And so from the very start of our laboratory, we combined a number of methods, including mass spectrometry proteomics, computation, proximity by tenylation. And over the years, we've constructed a reference protein atlas that we call mitocarda. This is a protein parts list, if you will, for this organelle. We make it freely available to the clinical community and to the research community. And this has served as a framework for systems investigations of the organelle in health and in disease. With that list in hand, we and others have been able to sequence the genomes of patients that have mitochondrial disease and identify the genes that underlie rare mitochondrial disease. And to date, more than 300 single genes have been identified that when mutated, give rise to these devastating, terrible, uh, typically childhood uh, diseases. And as of today, we have very few cures for these medicines, if any. I think this is a great systems biology problem. We now know that this oxidative phosphorylation system that's largely conserved from mitochondria to bacteria, there's at least 300 different ways that this can be broken at birth. And when that happens, Sometimes all it does is it will cause eye disease only. Yet in other instances, when you have a mutation in a neighboring protein, every single one of these organ manifestations um, uh, will occur. And so it's very, very perplexing how 
two lesions, okay, in the same part of the mitochondrial respiratory chain, one will only give rise to eye disease, but the other will give rise to multisystemic disease. This is a very complex organelle. There's a lot of feedback loops, redundancy, robustness, and really trying to understand it as a system is, is a hard problem. And this is actually what TL is going to be talking about today. He's going to be using uh, a genetics approach, a systems genetics approach, to really try to understand the homeostasis of this organelle. And it's giving rise to very interesting results. Another big theme in our laboratory today is uh, the relationship between ambient oxygen and mitochondrial dysfunction. This is something that we reported back in 2016, a really fascinating phenomenon. There's a mouse model of what's called mitochondrial Lee syndrome. This is a terrible, terrible brain disease. This mouse at sea level will die at two months of age from its brain disease. However, we reported in 2016 that if you place this mouse at 11% oxygen, that's the equivalent of South America or Mont Blanc or base camp, not Mount Everest, but you know about 15,000 feet elevation. This is what the survival curve of that mouse is. That mouse does not develop brain neurological disease anymore. And conversely, if we place that mouse in high oxygen at levels that all healthy humans and mice should tolerate, that mouse is very sick. And so we discovered that hypoxia is a very powerful suppressor of mitochondrial dysfunction. It doesn't work for every form of mitochondrial disease, but it works for a lot. And so we're now doing active, active research, trying to understand what's the full mechanism by which dialing down ambient oxygen can help to rescue an organism that has a broken mitochondrion. And importantly, can we harness hypoxia as a medicine? And so the fourth uh, broad area of our laboratory, and this may resonate with some of the audience that's interested in systems uh, in synthetic biology in particular. We're very interested in mitochondrial biology and bioenergetics and metabolism. And so we're trying to develop new genetic tools with which to manipulate energy metabolism. And so we have reported the use of a naturally occurring enzyme, a water forming NADH oxidase that transfers four electrons from NADH to oxygen to produce water that decreases the NADH to NAD ratio. We've been able to express this in the mitochondrion and in the cytosol, even in animals. And this has served as a powerful tool to understand NADH, NAD redox biology. Now, whereas water forming NADH oxidases occur naturally, in, occur in, in, naturally uh, there are no naturally occurring water forming NADPH oxidases. So we solved the structure of this enzyme. We created a quintuple mutant that is as active and as specific for NADPH as a natural enzyme is for NADH. So this is a purely engineered enzyme, and this has been very useful in the cancer world to try to understand the role of NADPH in um, uh, biochemistry and physiology. And most recently, we just reported a first generation chemogenetic generator of oxygen. This is a genetic tool that will allow us to uh, allow cells to uh, generate their own puffs of uh, oxygen. And so if any of you are out there have experience in synthetic biology, and in particular, protein design, we're trying to recruit at the level of postdoc or staff. So please, please reach out to me if you're interested in this type of stuff. And so uh, with that, uh, as an overview of our laboratory, it's uh, a real pleasure. Again, uh, you know, one of the joys of my job is being able to work with uh, TL uh, To, an extremely talented uh, synthetic biologist, uh, and he's been working as a group leader and research scientist here at the Broad Institute since 2015. And uh, what I'm going to do now is hand it over to Taysuk so that he can introduce TL. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. I was so amazed by your variety of research area. And you know what? It's, it could be coincident I submit a paper that is all about energetic, and I got you know, review back today with a very minor revision. I'm really happy, but I kind of add one additional new kind of direction that is actually we use uh, heat as a real product, not the side of product. So we actually wanted to help, uh, you know, divers, especially the uh, ONR, uh, you know, the search, I mean, diver to generate more heat 
you know, during the diving process because the problem of those diver is the hypothermia. Yeah. And then and then your your hypo hypoxic kind of you know uh result that's kind of fascinating to me. I, I want to learn more about that, you know, you know, research in the future. And and I probably need to read more paper about you know your, your research. Um, thank you so much. That's so amazing. Thank you so much. Great. All right. So let's uh uh move on. Okay, so now the main speaker of today with a longer introduction. Dr. Tier To is a group leader, as he mentioned, and senior research scientist in the metabolism program at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard under direction of Bamsi Musa, today's pioneer speaker. The main focus of his current work is to use chemical and systems biology approaches to investigate micro mitochondrial function and dysfunction in humans, as well as their broad implication for many common disease and AG associated pathogen uh, pathologies. I actually watched uh, you know some TV show yesterday about AG and new kind of medicine kind of reverse aging. And I'm really fascinated by, you know, today's talk uh, by both of the speaker today. In addition, he is developing new methodologies to expand the utility of CRISPR-Cas9 based technologies on studying human metabolism. Previously, Thier was a postdoctoral fellow at UC San Francisco, where he worked pre primarily on fluorescence uh, protein-based assay development in the laboratory of Xiao Kun Xu. Prior to his postdoctoral appointment, Tia spent a short stint in the private biotech company working on using synthetic biology for the production of biofuels and other sustainable products. Tia holds a BS degree in a chemical engineering, actually my classmate, and biochemistry and molecular biology from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and a PhD in chemical engineering uh, from MIT. Uh, he and at that time, you know, he and I was in the classmate. He was, in fact, uh, again my classmate at MIT. Also spent time together at UCSF. During his undergraduate and graduate study, Thier pursued research in systems biology investigating topics ranging from biological oscillators to gene regulation. I think he's the one of the geniuses I ever met. I'm so happy to listen to his talk today. And Tia, thank you so much for your time today. And please take it away. Thank you. So one, one thing where you, you introduce uh, Vamsi, you miss is actually he's a certified genius. <laughs> so Vamsi is actually <laughs> a winner of the MacArthur Genius Award in 2004. So he's actually a certified one and I'm very flattered by the wonderful introductions from both of you. I and... guess genius gathered together. <laughs> All right, so let me just uh, show my slides. All right. Wonderful. Seeing this okay? Oh, wonderful. So um, I just want to share a very focused story on the system's biology of mitochondria that is enabled by this system genetics approach. And specifically, I want to highlight some very uh, unique and unexpected features of the respiratory chain complex one. Uh, so Vamsi gave a wonderful introduction to mitochondrial disorders. So it came in different flavors, uh, ranging from ultra rare genetic disorders to normal aging. So how mitochondrial defect contribute to such a broad diverse varieties of pathologies is unclear. But what is potentially clear is that that ought to be genetic networks um, that can either protect against or contribute to the pathologies in these mitochondrial disorders, but these genetic networks uh, have not been systematically mapped yet. And therefore we took 
a chemical genetic approach to systematically dissect this genetic circuitry. Uh, here we combine um, very well studied uh, specific drugs to mitochondria with the state of the art uh, functional genomics technology, such as the CRISPR uh, screening library. And in the presence of mitochondrial inhibitors, we can systematically identify gene disruption or pathway disruption that need to more pathology or those that can actually provide homeostatic response that is, that's a beneficial. And this type of mapping help us to understand the genetic circuitry underlying mitochondrial dysfunction, identification of genetic modifiers, which hopefully in one day can actually inspire new approaches to therapeutic intervention. So we are going to focus on the OSFOS system, which comprises of five macromolecular complexes. Uh, complexes one through four form an electron transport chain that take electrons from reducing equivalents such as NADH and, and use it to reduce molecular oxygen. And the free energy from this redox reactions is conserved to generate a proton motive force across the mitochondrial inner membrane. And complex five, which is the ATP synthase, can then uh, use this force to generate ATP. So it turns out this OSFOS system is really prone to be poisoned. And there are very good specific inhibitors on different complexes. Uh, for complex one, there are pyrocidin and metformin. For complex three, there, there's antimycin, complex five, oligomycin. And we can also completely collapse the membrane potential, the protomotive force using a combination of antimycin and oligomycin. And on top of that, we can also target the mitochondrial central dogma. We can block, deplete the empty DNA replication using ethereum bromide, as well as blocking uh, the translation of mitochondrial protein using chloramphenicol. So we have this battery of mitochondrial drugs, and we can combine them with genome-wide CRISPR lockout library to systematically identify gene deletions that either reduce or enhance the fitness of the cells. So we perform pool CRISPR screening in the leukemia K562 cells in triplicate. Uh, we treat the cells with different mitochondrial poisons, let them grow for 15 days, and then we use next generation sequencing to uh, quantify the guide RNA, guide, guide RNA abundance within the population uh, as a proxy for how the lockout affect the fitness uh, of the cells. So here what I'm showing is the growth phenotypes of uh, the cells under these drugs. As you can see, all of the drugs actually cause growth defect to different extent, although they all proliferate as well. And this growth phenotype allow us to really look at both the genetic lockout that alleviate the growth phenotype as, as well as those that actually aggravate it. Um, so in order to quantify this chemical genetic interaction, we look at the fitness. We compare the fitness uh, of the gene knockout in the drug uh, to that of the vehicle DMSO control. So the fitness is defined by this Z-score, which is basically the comparison of guide RNA abundance uh, in the later time point under the drug uh, compared to the baseline at early time point where the, before the drugs was, uh, were added. Um, so a positive C-score means there's enrichment of the, the gene knockout in the population that suggests this actually has a higher fitness uh, within the population, whereas a negative C-score means the lockout uh, have the guide to be depleted in the population, meaning the fitness of this lockout is actually worse uh, in the drug. So most of the genes uh, in the library actually lie on the diagonal of uh, this plot. And we are most interested in the point that are off this big cloud. So at the south of the cloud are type of interaction which I call synthetic sick and lethal interaction. So these are gene knockout that suffer a much greater fitness defect in the drug compared to that in the control. 
On the other end of the cloud is what I would call buffering interaction. So this um, gene knockout that actually have higher fitness level in the drug compared to the DMSO control. And we can actually further split these two categories into suppressors in which the lockout actually have absolute uh, growth advantage within the population. So they are having a positive and high Z score. So they actually grow better than uh, an average member of the library. Whereas uh, we also have this epistatic buffering in which the lockout may not have an absolute growth uh, advantage, but they are actually doing better in the drug as compared to the DMSO control. So they basically suffer less with the drug. So this chemical genetic mapping uh, allows us to identify chemical genetic interaction that are high confidence uh, involving more than 200, about 200 genes, including three of the genes that uh, have been have been reported to uh, show genetic interaction with mitochondrial dysfunction. And our data set also provide a chemical context to draw specificity for these positive controls. So I just want to highlight one high level observation. So we see that the intramitochondrial interaction, so that is defined by interaction involving genes that encode for mitochondrial proteins, to represent 66% of all interactions. And given that uh, the genome only has 6% of the gene that encode mitochondrial proteins, uh, there, there is actually a 10 rich enrichment in such intramitochondrial interaction that really suggests a very dense interconnectivity of function within the mitochondria, within the organelle. So we able to generate a very comprehensive uh, compendium of genetic modifiers. But I just want to really focus on two specific uh, interactions, which are both intramitochondrial. So I will first very briefly talk about a synthetic lethal interaction uh, with a gene named GPX4. So GPX4, is a redox enzyme that it contains selenium, is utilized reduced glutathione to uh, reduce and clear uh, lipid hydroperoxide. So lipid hydroperoxide uh, can form a lipid radical in the presence of ferrous iron uh, to create uh, an, an uncontrolled chain reaction that may ultimately lead to a cell death process named ferroptosis. Um, so this is the main known function of GPX4 is to uh, prevent ferroptosis. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple isoforms of GPX4 in the cytosol, in the mitochondria, or nucleus. And in fact, one of the old proteomics data set from Mutha lab showed that GPX4 is actually found in the mitochondria of all mouse, mouse tissues. But then... Uh, a surprising thing is that in the recent literature of ferroptosis, uh, mitochondria are not uh, considered a key uh, subcellular location for ferroptosis. So this is kind of inconsistent with what we are finding here. But anyway, we were able to uh, confirm that uh, the screening result in which uh, mitochondrial inhibitor has a synthetic lethal relationship with uh, GPX4 loss. So here we inhibit uh, osphos with oligomycin, complex 5 inhibitor, and when it's co-treated with uh, a specific covalent inhibitor uh, of GPX4, uh, which was discovered actually at, uh, at the Harvard University system by Stuart Stryber's lab, then we can see the cells actually uh, undergo cell death. Then the important question is uh, to confirm the location of this synthetic lethal interaction. So here, what we did is we just co we just express our uh, isoform of GPX4 uh, in a lockout background uh, that target the protein primarily and only in the mitochondria, and that's actually sufficient to reverse the synthetic relationship, uh, synthetic lethal relationship. Uh, this provide evidence that indeed mitochondria are the location where this interaction happened. 
And we also collect a set of data that shows uh, the induction of mitochondrial GPX4 when we treat cells either with chemical inhibitors or when we have a, a group of genetic lockout models in mouse. So the mitochondrial GPX4 actually go up in level uh, in response to mitochondrial dysfunction. And these two pieces of data together uh, led us to think about a model in which mitochondrial GPX4 uh, as an adaptive homeostatic element under osphos dysfunction. So it's induced by osphos dysfunction so that it provides a feedback to really ensure survival. And since we published this work in 2019, there are other groups that actually report mitochondria as a relevant site for ferroptosis. So this perhaps is more wide, widespread than we thought. Um, okay, so that's a very brief vignette on the synthetic lethal interactions. I will spend the rest of my time to talk about complex one. So um, we, we, we were able to identify a group of suppressors that are novel, but by far the most striking is that when we inhibit complex five uh, under oligomycin, almost all complex one subunits score as suppressors. So this is a very novel result and it couldn't have been identified in the past by uh, previous genetic interaction mapping methodology because uh, in the past, uh, the e saccharomyces cerevisiae was often used for chemical genetics mapping. And the fact is that yeast actually doesn't have a macromolecular uh, complex one. So we are probably lucky enough to have the CRISPR to help us to do this in mammalian cells so that we have this striking finding. So a little bit about complex one. So it's a very big macromolecular complex with about 45 subunits. So its main function is to take two electrons from NADH and pass it to coenzyme Q. So uh, it can be inhibited by drugs like piracetin as well as the uh, diabetes drug metformin. Um, so what I'm showing here is that when we block complex five, the ATP synthase with oligomycin, almost all subunits of complex one score as suppressor, meaning if you lose complex one subunit, the cells actually grow better under complex five inhibition. So that's a pretty weird result. Um, and because all the genes actually, all the subunits of complex one actually score, there's not really any structural or functional determinant within complex one that uh, spotlight the interaction. But anyway, we were able to really confirm this result in multiple cell types, uh, with genetic lockout, as well as uh, with pericidin or metformin. And in all these cases, the combination of complex one and complex five inhibition actually causes cells to proliferate better than complex five inhibition alone. So this is pretty weird, but we can actually uh, reason this from first principles. So there's some hypothesis that support this interaction. So the first thing we thought about is actually pyrimidine. Pyrimidine, uh, there's a de novo pyrimidine synthesis pathway, uh, and the renaming step is the dehydroorotate dehydrogenase. So it's actually coupled to the electron transport chain uh, because it actually used the oxidized pool of coenzyme Q as a substrate. So when you have oligomycin, you basically block electron transfer and that will basically prevent the oxidation, the oxidation of the Q pool so that DHODH can no longer use its substrate. So there's a stall in the de novo pyrimidine synthesis. Um, and other consequence of blocking complex five is that the proton motive force get higher just because it, it is no longer dissipated by complex five for making ATP. And both of this provide a recipe for the generation of toxic superoxide at, at complex one. And then when we simultaneously inhibit complex one on top of complex five inhibition, so two things could happen. So one is that you may actually eliminate the site uh, at which this superoxide is generated. And the second thing is that because complex one is the by far the major consumer of the coenzyme Q pool, if you block complex one, you basically uh, make the Q pool more oxidized. 
uh, even if there's actually a downstream blockade by uh, oligomycin. So that will allow a small fraction of uh, kill pool to be released and be utilized by DHODH. So this is the kind of hypothesis at the beginning, but uh, we find those are not the reasons for this interaction. So first, uh, we perform all the CRISPR screening with supplement of uridine, and in this cell type, uridine can be converted into pyrimidine uh, through the uh, uh, pyrimidine salvage pathway. As you can see, the interaction, the rescue of C1, C5 together uh, actually uh, is the same with or without uridine. And the Ross uh, hypothesis is also not true because uh, with inhibitors such as piracidin, you actually drives up the Ross level compared to just oligomycin its own. So neither of this actually explain what we are observing. Uh, so we end up looking more closely into the bioenergetics and metabolism of this interaction. So the first thing we check is whether um, piracidin actually changed the oxygen consumption a phenotype of oligomycin. So what we find is that uh, piracidin does not rescue the oxygen consumption. And if anything, it actually eliminates all the residual oxygen consumption by oligomycin. So it completely shut down oxygen consumption here. And a neat thing is that uh, we actually observe a stronger glycolytic activity in cells that are treated with both pyrocid and oligomycin as compared to just oligo itself. Um, so we actually perform this measurement in two independent assays. One is to look at the media latte level. The other is used uh, to measurement of extracellular uh, acidification flux. So both of this suggest we actually have an increase in glycolysis with the combination of complex one and complex five uh, inhibition. And through metabolomics, we also observed a higher steady state level of NADH, NAD, and that suggests there's an increased reduction potential in the cell. So one possibility is that the NADH become higher because you eliminate all the residual uh, NADH oxidation uh, with complete blockade of uh, complex one. So I will come back to uh, this later, but I also want to talk about what is the functional consequence of having like a higher reduction potential in the cell. So one of the hints actually came from full scan metabolomics uh, of the cell treated with bopyracidin and oligomycin. And we observed a uh, marked market increase in 2-hydroxyglutarate, which is often a marker for reductive carboxylation of alpha-ketoglutarate. Uh, so to confirm the reductive carboxylation boost, by a simultaneous inhibition of complex one and complex five, we use glutamine C13 glutamine tracing. So the, the glutamine is converted into alpha glutarate, and in the TCA cycle, it can undergo one of the two fates. It, it can either be uh, oxidized to citrate using the standard oxidative TCA cycle, and in that case, it will generate M plus four isotopomer of citrate, or it can undergo uh, reductive carboxylation that is strongly dependent on NADH or NADPH to generate M plus five as a topomer of citrate. And indeed, um, with the combination of complex one, complex five inhibition, we saw a much higher level of M plus five isopotomer, suggesting that the reductive carboxylation flux is stronger with the combination. Uh, we also observe an increase in proline, is specific to M plus five label proline, and the interpretation is that proline can be converted uh, uh, from glutamine using NADH, NADPH uh, enzyme, dependent enzyme. So they also provide evidence that reductive metabolism is actually stronger uh, in these cells. So just very quickly summarize uh, what I just said. Uh, with oligomycin blocking ATP synthase, so there is no longer any mitochondrial ATP production, but the cell can still rely on glycolysis to provide ATP. So glycolysis also provides NADH, which since there's actually residual uh, oxidation of NADH uh, by complex one, uh, the level may not be as high, but once you actually block complex one uh, with drugs or genetic lockout, you eliminate the residual 
oxidation of NADH. So now you conserve NADH. So this conserved NADH can be exchanged into NADPH. Uh, so their reduction potential can be changed through several enzymes in the cytosol or mitochondria. And this surplus of NADPH perhaps can drive the reductive, reductive synthesis of molecules such as proline or isocitrate, which ultimately go to citrate. So the next question is whether this boost in reductive synth synthesis is actually a uh, contributor to the improved proliferation. And indeed we have one evidence, one piece of evidence to support that. Um, so it's really uh, um, a reminder of the tools that uh, Vamsi mentioned in, in his uh, part of the presentation. So we use this water forming NADPH oxidase uh, that can really convert directly NADPH into NADP. So basically now we can force the consumption of NADPH. And once we do this forced consumption, so we reduce the NADPH level and then we no longer see their growth benefit uh, by simultaneous uh, inhibition of complex one and complex five, suggesting that the reductive synthesis perhaps is really linked to proliferation. And I just want to actually throw in a provocative hypothesis here. So uh, in the work, in, my, in, our, in, in the work I just showed you, we, we use oligomycin to block complex five, but it could be actually a physiological way to inhibit complex five. And for example, in worm, uh, it has been shown that complex five activity actually declines during aging uh, in the worm. And then as we know, metformin is known to be a potential anti-aging uh, medicine and it's even in clinical trials for aging. So one of the hypotheses is whether metformin can exert its anti-aging efficacy through uh, the suppression of uh, age-associated complex five declines, maybe with one of the uh, reasoning that I just uh, uh, invoke redox rebalancing, maybe increased glycolysis, reductive metabolism, and so on. Of course, this is just hypothesis and there will be a lot of work to do to prove that. So I just want to um, <clears throat> maybe take a step back and provide, put things into a broader context. So, so one of the question is why can you eliminate like a key part of the electron transport chain? So one thing is the electron transport chain can be uh, complemented by uh, cytosolic pathway such as glycolysis for ATP generation, as well as pentophosphate pathway and nitrogen dehydrogenase for redox homeostasis. So they're redundant pathway outside of mitochondria. But then you will ask why is specific complex one but not other complexes. So the reasoning here is that there are actually multiple Q-linked uh, dehydrogenases that can take other reducing equivalent. Uh, for example, you can take dehydroorotate, as I mentioned, uh, through the de novo pyrimidine synthesis. You can take uh, glycerol 3 phosphate from glycolysis, some kind of fatty acid and amino acid, choline, et cetera. So they can directly donate electrons to the Q pool um, and then to sustain electron transport uh, within mitochondrial electron transport chain to perhaps provide some energetic uh, support. So complex one can be um, dispensable just by the design of electron transport chain. So it, it's actually a branch electron transport chain in human cells as well as in other organisms. Okay, so now we know it's potentially dispensable, but why could it even become advantageous? Because even in our case of oligomycin, we actually saw that it provide a real growth um, uh, advantage. So. I'm just trying to, there are probably multiple reasons. I just want to kind of uh, discuss a few of them. So one is there are actually multiple adaptive signaling pathways uh, that will be activated uh, in the context of mitochondrial dysfunction. For example, the poster child is the AMP kinase, which is activated by uh, an increase of AMP to a, is, it was, uh, with respect to ATP. And activation of AMP kinase can need to increase glycolysis, glucose uptake, so you make more ATP uh, through glycolysis. 
It can downregulate protein synthesis probably through mTOR pathway. So now we can conserve ATP. It can also activate autophagy so that you can recycle nutrient that way. And perhaps a similar effect from mitochondrial inhibition is it can trigger uh, something called retrograde signaling to the nucleus through multiple means, including unfolded protein response through bioenergetic defect or through some kind of ROS signaling. So they can relay their dysfunctional mitochondrial signal to the nucleus and some stress response pathways such as the integrated stress response through ATF4 can then turn on pathways that are protective to mitochondrial dysfunction. And of course, there are other potential reasons that I discussed, such as the redox rebalancing hypothesis in, in this work. And then one of the pretty obvious thing is that you have this complex one, which contains 45 subunits. So in principle, it should be pretty energetically costly to even maintain, sustain it. Uh, it could be some kind of raw suppression. It can be promotion of pyrimidine biosynthesis that we discussed or it can even be some kind of attenuation of uh, some adaptive stress response. So this is just hypothesis, but I also want to emphasize one very uh, important concept here that is related to aging is the antagonistic pyotropy idea. So this term basically suggests a gene or pathway that can be detrimental in one state but then become beneficial in an other state. So perhaps that's actually the case for aging as well as OSFOS activity. So the thesis here is perhaps OSFOS activity provide a different optimum at different stage of life. So at later stage, perhaps a lower OSFOS activity will give you like the maximal fitness. And what is nice about complex one is perhaps it's actually the best way to really create this antagonistic interaction because of the multiple reasons we mentioned, such as it's dispensable, it's costly to maintain, and it's also uh, subject to multiple regulation as well as a signaling event. And in fact, you can certainly find uh, abundance of examples in model organisms such as C. elegans, such as fruit flies, such as killifish, in which this convincing data showing that complex one, specific complex one uh, in activation can actually extend lifespan. So besides aging, uh, there are also multiple survival or fitness benefits under complex one in activation. So here uh, provide an example in development. So in frog X, uh, it turns out not only complex one level is super down regulated. In fact, the, the, the frog eggs are no longer sensitive to complex one inhibitors, suggesting that uh, its function is completely dispensable during development. Whereas um, with other OSFOS complex inhibitors, you just observe a very uh, large amount of cell death. And here they invoke a mechanism uh, that is related to reactive oxygen species. And here is actually a paper from uh, Jens Nielsen's lab that combined mathematical modeling with uh, human proteomics. What they show here is they try to argue that uh, during intense exercise, during intense exercise, uh, the optimum or the Pareto front uh, actually contains a complex one bypass scenario. So they consider a combination of substrate efficiency, which is ATP per carbon in the substrate, and the catalytic capacity, which is ATP per uh, protein mass of the catalyst. They come up with this optimum for high intensity exercise, suggesting that maybe even in a physiological condition, complex one loss can provide certain benefit. So in the realm of pathophysiology, so we have multiple data suggesting that in neurodegeneration, in activating complex one is actually beneficial. So here, one example is when uh, the neurons were treated with uh, aggregation of alpha cellulin, having a complex one mutant actually make the neurons insensitive to this uh, alpha cellulin insult, suggesting that uh, complex one inhibition actually pre-set their pre 
uh, condition the neurons to be insensitive to any insult from this protein no pathology by alpha seleucine. And in the cancer world, um, we have evidence of, for example, complex two uh, mutant cells actually were rescued by uh, complex one inhibitor. Uh, so this is kind of similar to what we saw with oligomycin and complex one inhibitor. So here they actually argue that it's the aspartate synthesis that actually is restored by uh, inhibiting complex one. So I just want to end with a few very important observations by the Mutha lab uh, that really resonate with uh, the fact that proliferation can be benefited from complex one loss. So this is a brand new paper from the group. Uh, they look at a certain type of uh, thyroid cancer and that is characterized by massive accumulation of mtDNA mutation that are specifically on complex one genes. So what is striking is uh, complex one activity is almost uh, eliminated uh, in this tumor, but not the activity of other complex subunits. Uh, so we also have evidence that uh, the complex one loss can actually be the driver of tumorogenesis, but not just a bystander. And when we look at tumor, a lot of uh, people would think about, okay, they are under a hypoxia environment. And uh, indeed, I think Mutha Lab has also uh, looked into hypoxia and, and specifically here, I show you one result in which uh, we found that uh, complex one inactivation can actually provide proliferation benefit uh, in the context of hypoxia. So I will just end with this really striking uh, observation. This is through phylogenetic profiling. And what is striking here is that complex one subunit actually lost uh, at least four times independently through evolution. So they are lost in species in East species, Nysaccharomyces cerevisiae, as well as species Nyplasmodium, which cause malaria. Um, so I don't think we have a good understanding of the mechanism by which complex one loss in this case, but what seems consistent with the independent loss is that perhaps complex one loss really create a selective advantage in this lineages under the environment in which they inhabit. All right, so that's my talk. And I just want to take the final moment to really acknowledge uh, Vamsi Mutha, who really was spectacular in assembling a group of very delegated and, and talented scientists uh, and provide uh, extraordinary mentorship as well as uh, guidance. And these are the scientists that contributed this work. So I would also want to acknowledge our collaborators as well as the funding uh, sources. All right. So I hope it's not too different from uh, the past seminars, but uh, I'm really happy to have a discussion with you guys on this now. That That is fantastic. You know, who would not be interested in aging or living longer? So this is fantastic. I, I have a question, <laughs> actually, more broad question. So this is very interesting research, and, and then especially regarding aging, and they're living longer. But my question is more broader. Uh, what would be a best way to live longer without considering all the problems we're currently facing, including, uh, you know, climate change, you know, causing more disaster, and then car accident, probably number one rate for uh, uh, death. But without considering those things, what how what what is the best way in terms of lifestyle based on your research, and then which location is the best place to live, based on your oxygen or other you know data? I just curious. So, uh, yeah. So I I I showed some work from the lab, but I think the lab has done so much work uh, uh, on oxygen. Um, uh -huh. That's actually one new paper from Mutha Lab um, uh, on PLOS biology. 
So what it's showing is they use a mouse model of aging. Uh -huh. Basically, it's a mutant in a DNA repair enzyme. Sure. And this is actually a pretty wide, widely used model for aging. Uh -huh. uh, probably one of the most uh, accepted model uh, besides dietary restriction. So it's a widely accepted model. And the key finding is that when we actually grow this mice in no oxygen, they live longer. So the, that means what kind of location are you recommending to live longer yes. in, in the United States? Maybe in Colorado. <laughs> Colorado, because that the, the altitude is high. Altitude maybe is equivalent to an oxygen level that actually provide uh, benefit uh, in the context of um, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh huh. Right? Yeah. So we, we need to move to Colorado in the case. We move to Colorado, but there's also a lot of adaptation. And like maybe eating is like food intake is different when you uh -huh. move to high altitude. Uh, maybe your mental health is different when you move to high altitude. Of course, so, of course. <laughs> just trade offs, but. If we are talking about a severe mitochondrial disorder, so perhaps uh -huh. it's actually where moving to Colorado or moving to Mount Everest, uh -huh. uh, reasonable course of action. Sure. But then in terms of aging, that, there are two main things. One is the biological aging, the, the lifespan. The other is the health span. Right. And so I guess even in 2023, if you talk about health span, I would say, not that I'm an exercise expert, I would say it's probably exercise that is uh -huh. the most effective uh, preventive means of countering aging. But what right. is nice about the work that comes from um, Jans Nielsen's lab is that complex one bypass is actually one of their favorite, the most efficient way to utilize energy during intense exercise. So right. perhaps one of the idea here is, is we potentially can combine exercise with maybe complex one inactivation or some kind of down regulation of complex one and that could potentially achieve like the best outcome. So that, that's just one high level idea, but yeah. So that's, that's fantastic. I, I understand the exercise is very important, but I just want to connect exercise with the oxygen you know, data you have so mm -hmm. how 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 what is the you know, best easy easiest way to understand exercise result in uh better health of course better health but longer life I mean is it kind of correlate or it's not nothing to do with the oxygen thing. But when you exercise, you also lower the oxygen level, right? You just right. consume more. <laughs> but more uptake of the oxygen anyway because during exercise. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so I just want to. Deep, kind of deconvolute or the you know kind of dissect input you know uptake they probably higher but at the same time consumption is higher and then I just want to understand how that correlate with the oxygen theory you have. I I mean like in a cell in cell culture it, it can be something simple but in 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 a whole animal in in human that's a uh -huh. system systemic. Uh, problem right because you have um, the vascular transport you have hemoglobins you just have a lot of feedback loops so uh -huh. this can be a very complex uh, system to understand i see and at least i'm not an expert in exercise physiology sure. by any means but um what happened in cell culture probably requires a lot more work to really be translated I in see. whole animal yeah so that means there's no simple solution to live longer, right? Uh, maybe low oxygen is one possibility, although again, okay, uh, we just need to have like real uh, human object or something like that, you know. I see. I think it actually works in, in mouse models. I see. That's inter very interesting to me. Let me check whether we have question from audience. Um, let me see. Uh, I did see one. Okay, now I see my clock is already past 11. So mm -hmm. let me close and then we, we could chat later uh, after the uh, this the former seminar.
So let me mm -hmm. close for now. So thank you all for joining and staying today. And we will meet again on July 20th, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. We'll have Professor Rojomu Yachi at UBC and Professor Ania Betika at Drexel University. As usual, the follow up informal chat will occur without recording. Please stay here if you are interested in chatting with today's speakers. Uh, thanks, and I've stopped recording. Just give me one second.